On this Wednesday night, new questions about the RCMP response in Nova Scotia. The confusion and the chaos during the manhunt. And why did the RCMP rely on Twitter instead of issuing an emergency alert? And why did some Americans in Nova Scotia get warnings? Plus, those in mourning share their memories. She was so super cool. One of those guys that uh, they broke the law when he was born. COVID-19 outbreaks at Canadian meat and poultry facilities, how the virus is spreading there, and celebrating Earth Day during a pandemic. How the lessons we're learning now could be applied to climate change. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We're continuing to cover the two biggest stories in this country, the pandemic and a mass murder. We begin in Nova Scotia. The RCMP there have given more information about their response to the worst mass killing in Canadian history. At least 22 people were murdered. We know that for almost 14 hours starting late Saturday night, a gunman disguised as an RCMP officer was roaming a remote part of rural Nova Scotia, killing people he knew and shooting others apparently at random. The RCMP now say when they arrived on the scene, they found victims, but the gunman was on the loose. They began to search. Yet the only alert to the public that night was a tweet about a firearms complaint. No emergency alert was ever issued, something many say could have saved lives. By morning, the RCMP began tweeting again. At 8.02 a.m. on Sunday, the RCMP began providing real-time information on its Nova Scotia RCMP Twitter account. Twitter allowed our information to be shared, followed and broadcast by local, provincial and national news outlets. At 10.15 a.m., Nova Scotia provincial emergency management officials contacted the RCMP to offer the use of the public emergency alerting system. We were in the process of preparing an alert when the gunman was shot and killed by the RCMP. The RCMP described the situation that night and into the morning as fluid and dynamic. They say they know the public and the loved ones of victims have plenty of questions. Ross Lord has our top story tonight. RCMP investigators are still combing through scattered devastation at 16 crime scenes with the military providing tents and other support. Little has been said officially about the victims at this burnt out home, but the location on a remote road in Wentworth, Nova Scotia, suggests it was a targeted attack. The Mounties are short on answers to this and other questions about the rampage. We have those same questions and we'll be seeking answers. There are new clues about the chaotic effort to stop him. Investigators said today they spent the overnight hours between Saturday and Sunday focused on a specific area. This fire hall has bullet holes from gunfire Sunday morning. The hall was being prepared as a shelter for residents moved to safety from Portapique. Witnesses say RCMP officers were there, but the serious incident response team, which is investigating, says the gunman was not, raising questions about who officers were firing at. Investigators say the suspect did not have a firearms license, and they have not yet said what type of guns or other weapons were used. Some victims' families and friends say if the Maudis had initiated an emergency alert instead of using Twitter messages, fewer lives would be lost. Not everyone has Twitter or even Facebook or even Internet, but we all have a television or a telephone. Some people did receive an alert. The U.S. consulate says it used the RCMP's Twitter information to send email alerts to American citizens in Nova Scotia. Premier Stephen McNeil says his emergency officials reached out to the Mounties. We would not go from what's happening uh, by Twitter. We would need the, the lead agency to actually craft the message so that we could put that out and no message was received, uh, even though EMO had reached out a number of times throughout the morning uh, to the RCMP. Troubling new questions. Were there mistakes made by incident commander else or someone else? Or was it a matter of we need to change procedure? Um, on how we respond to these types of calls when we have a gun call, maybe in rural areas. RCMP management says they were in the process of preparing an alert when the gunman was killed. That was 13 hours after the Mounties discovered the first victims and identified their suspect. So a lot of the delay was based on uh, communications between 
the EMO and the various officers. And then a discussion about what the uh, message uh, uh, would, would be, how it would be constructed and what it would say. The gunman had vehicles restored in the garage behind his denture clinic. Scott Blakeney spruced up the shooter's motorbikes five years ago. He took this picture in the garage, which has the same background as the notorious image RCMP released of the mock-up police car used during the rampage. I would say the, the vehicle was parked exactly where those bikes were parked at the time I was detailing them. So when I looked at it, that's, that's, that's him. Police have removed the clinic's storefront to sets of gigantic teeth. Small consolation. The Mounties do say they're very close to releasing a detailed timeline of the shooter's movements, although they're still piecing together some gaps, including revealing how many officers were at these various scenes as they tried to track down the killer. Donna? All right, Ross Lord in Halifax, thanks. The people of Enfield, Nova Scotia and nearby communities held a memorial today to honour the RCMP officer killed in the line of duty. A parade of vehicles made its way to the local RCMP detachment. It's less than a kilometre down the road from where the shooting spree came to an end. Enfield was the home detachment of Constable Heidi Stevenson. She was a 23-year veteran of the force. She was one of many victims. Global News has now confirmed the identities of 18 of the 22 people killed. They include a beloved teacher, healthcare workers, and a retired firefighter who rushed into action to help his neighbors. Loving couples and a family of three also had their lives cut short. Our Mike Jolet has been learning more about each of their stories from their friends and loved ones. The Tuck Oliver family had thought the darkness had finally passed them by. Both of Aaron Tuck's parents recently died, and he, his wife Jolene, and daughter Emily had once again found laughter. Videos of the family are all that's kept Jolene's sister Tammy going. I'm not ready to go back through Emily's yet, because she was taken so early, but I just wanted to hear all their voices. You know, like, I'm just, scour I'm just scouring to hold on to memories. Emily is the youngest victim in this tragedy, a 17-year-old girl who liked fixing engines and had recently found her calling to be an apprentice welder. She grew into a person where, like, she was so super cool. I so super miss her. They were as tight a family as you could imagine, separated by three time zones, yet connected through technology. But in death, a mother needs more. And then my mom last night, one thing that she said, she wants to hold her hand that one last time. Tammy is struggling to make that happen. And as we learn more about the victims, it seems like so many of them would have offered to help. Men like retired Navy veteran and firefighter Tom Bagley, who died running towards one of the houses set on fire, turning away, his friends say, simply wasn't in his character. He's one of those guys that uh, they broke the wall when he was born and He'll always, he'll always be in my heart, in the heart of a lot of people. We've heard that a lot. These Nova Scotians who died so tragically were good. The Blairs, Greg and Jamie, were known for their laughter and warmth. If you were at their home, you stayed for dinner. And you can believe Greg's 46th birthday this week would have been a blast, even during times of physical distancing. Partied, drank. It would have been a good day. It would have been. We're going to celebrate still which that's what he'd want. So many sad stories about happy people. The least we can do is celebrate them for who they were. Mike Trollet, Global News. There were so many lives lost. You can find their stories on our website, globalnews.ca slash global national. Now to the crisis inside long-term care homes. The Premier of Quebec has asked for 1,000 more military personnel to help in long-term care homes in Quebec, where hundreds of people have died from COVID-19. Francois Legault says they've not been able to find enough trained workers to meet the immediate needs because so many regular staff have tested positive and are unable to work. And Ontario's Premier is now also asking for the military to help. This includes resources from Public Health Agency of Canada and Canadian Forces personnel. We will begin by directing that the additional personnel be deployed to five priority homes in the province. Their support will provide staffing relief 
so staff can focus on the care of the residents. Another 93 people are known to have died of COVID-19 in Quebec and another 37 in Ontario. The majority of those deaths happened in long-term care homes, where there are hundreds of outbreaks now. Many are getting worse, including at the Orchard Villa Retirement Residence in Pickering, Ontario. 31 residents have died there, a huge jump from four people who died last week. There are at least 145 confirmed cases of COVID-19 at that retirement home in residents and staff. Everyone who lives and works there has now been tested for the virus. The biggest outbreaks are in long-term care homes, and Ontario is now planning for all residents and staff in all of them to be tested. It's hoped that will give public health officials an idea of how pervasive the virus is in the province's nursing homes. Other facilities where outbreaks are now coming to light are meat processing and poultry processing plants and oil sands camps. Staff work in close quarters, sometimes travel to and from work together, and often share living space. While so many of us have been told to stay home, employees in those places are still working. And as Heather Urich's West reports, some say their companies are giving mixed messages about how to protect themselves. Jocelyn Ruiz has COVID-19. The High River Mother is one of more than 500 cases connected with an outbreak at the Cargill Meat Processing Plant south of Calgary. I was like, am I going to die? How about my family, my children? My, I was so scared. Every person or every household that I've known, Filipino, uh, there is uh, somebody tested positive. Health officials believe the outbreak spread from workers to family members and other household contacts, including some who worked at health facilities. Cargill shut down its facility on Monday. By then, one of its workers had already died. We feel very strongly that uh, there are grounds uh, for a criminal investigation uh, based on negligence causing uh, infection and in this case, uh, one fatality. Dozens of cases have also been confirmed at Canada's largest meatpacking facility near Brooks, Alberta. JBS says it's enhanced safety protocols for workers, but there are no plans yet to shut the plant down. This industry watcher says closing JBS may be inevitable, but having it happen while Cargill is down will have a significant impact on the country's food supply. Because both of them combined together would represent roughly about 70% of all the beef that is processed in Canada for Canadians. Health officials are learning the virus isn't just spreading inside these facilities, but that how workers get to and from these plants is a problem too. It's very, very difficult to implement physical distancing uh, measures uh, when everyone is in a bus, uh, everyone is on a bus, uh, everyone is bus to work or uh, everyone is carpooling and, uh, and there are some uh, immigrant workers living together as well. The Alberta government says it may launch a fatality inquiry into the Cargill workers' death, but people in High River now fear others may be at risk as this outbreak spreads. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. A financial lifeline is coming for post-secondary students and recent graduates. $9 billion has been earmarked by the federal government for the Canada Emergency Student Benefit. It will provide up to $1,250 a month from May to August. People who have a dependent or a disability will be eligible for up to $1,750 a month. There's also a promise to create 76,000 jobs for young people, including in sectors that need an extra hand fighting COVID-19. The Prime Minister also said today's support is coming in the days ahead for seniors whose retirement savings have taken a hit because of the drop in the stock market. There is evidence now Americans were dying of COVID-19 weeks before the first deaths were announced publicly and that it was spreading through the community. Autopsy results from two people who died at a home in California confirm they were infected with the virus. They died in Santa Clara County on February 6th and 17th. They had no known travel histories to China or anywhere else that would have exposed them to the virus, suggesting they got it through community spread. It wasn't until February 29th that the first COVID-19 death was officially recorded. The first confirmed case in the U.S. was January 21st in a Seattle man who had recently returned from China. A sign of the times coming up. The new way Parliament is meeting during the pandemic. 
Democracy doesn't stop during a crisis, and members of parliament have had to adapt how they work. A limited number of MPs will hold an in-person sitting once a week on Wednesdays, and for the first time in Canadian history, there will be virtual meetings of parliament on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The clerk of the House of Commons says technology isn't where it needs to be for all 338 MPs to take part virtually. And in the UK, MPs have had to adapt to our Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gomancing explains how the British Parliament has evolved how it does business. Order! Order. A familiar call out in uncharted territory. The pandemic forcing the UK House of Commons to embrace a radical shift. The chamber limited to 50 with an additional 120 MPs participating virtually. The member for Cardiff West with his supplementary question. Kevin Brennan. UK, UK. There were a few kinks. I don't know if I caught any more of that than you did. Altering the course after 700 years comes with challenges. But it is temporary. That is part of the point of this. This is whilst this crisis lasts. Canadian politicians agree to meet weekly in person with two additional virtual gatherings. We really are caught in a, in a totally unprecedented position. David Smith has spent his life studying and writing about parliamentary procedure. He says people must be able to see and hear politicians pitch and defend their positions, especially now. If you can limit it now, why couldn't you limit it when the pandemic's gone? Of course, nothing is happening without technology. Eyebrows were raised when the UK announced it was using Zoom, which has had instances of uninvited attendees disrupting meetings. This is a public meeting. This is something that's usually broadcast around the world. Um, it could be on YouTube, on Facebook. Um, so the concerns are there, but they're not significant. Security, accessibility, user knowledge. Most agree digital democracy is not perfect, but like everything right now, the priority is health. Crystal Gamansen, Global News, London. Hunger, pandemic ahead, a warning the coronavirus could lead to widespread famine. Watching Global National. An overcrowded refugee camp in Lebanon is under lockdown after a woman there tested positive for COVID-19. It's the first case in the camp, which is home to more than 2,000 people. The woman has been moved to a hospital and about 150 people at the camp are being tested. Nearly one million refugees in Lebanon are registered with the UN and many of them live in overcrowded camps. The United Nations Food Agency is sounding the alarm about hunger. It says the impact of the pandemic could cause multiple famines of biblical proportions. The worst case estimate is that more than 30 million people could die in a matter of months and 250 million could be pushed to the brink of starvation by the end of 2020 if immediate action isn't taken. Lockdowns because of COVID-19 have made food access extremely difficult in dozens of countries that were already struggling with conflict and the effects of climate change. Marking the 50th Earth Day next, we unearth the pandemic's effect on our planet. It's been 50 years since the first Earth Day was proclaimed, and look where we are. Economies around the world shut down because of a virus, and the only winner could be the environment. Five decades ago, an estimated 20 million Americans took to the streets for Earth Day. There were calls to limit pollution, clean up garbage, and do more to protect the Earth. Fifty years later, it is measures aimed at protecting people that are also protecting the planet, as Eric Sorensen explains. In the history of environmental awareness, there's never been an Earth Day that has come closer to reflecting the intended dream. A day of cleaner air and simpler pursuits. Roads not choked with traffic, the air not filled with as much noise. In Paris, tourists once took the haze for granted. Now they can't be there to see the surreal postcard that is today's Eiffel Tower. In China, the Great Wall, its magnificence now under clearer skies. But it has all come from a terrible scourge. Chinese who wore masks for smog now wear them for the virus. COVID-19 has exacted a devastating human and economic toll. 
But on a day set out to consider the future of the earth, the UN Secretary General says recovery and investment should be clean and green. We must act decisively to protect our planet from both the coronavirus and the existential threat of climate disruption. The pandemic shows that when humans change behavior en masse, it makes a difference. Satellite pictures show the dramatic reduction in pollution in China this year, with half a billion people under lockdown. A similar reduction in pollution in the industrial belt of northern Italy. The World Economic Forum says overall there has been an increase in air quality around the world. But clearing the skies temporarily won't solve the climate crisis. Experts say climate is a longer term and greater threat than the virus. The impact on economy and human well-being is going to be much higher than this COVID crisis has ever, ever had. Wake up, honey. A new campaign builds on the theme that our house, the earth, is on fire, and we are ignoring it. Have a good day. Some say the changes brought on by the virus should help us reimagine the future. This has been such a traumatic thing for the world that if we don't come out of it changed or better, then it's been a tremendous wasted opportunity. Milan, Italy, hit hard by COVID-19, sees its future in the clearing skies, planning to transform major streets to reduce cars and increase bikes and pedestrians. A small step in the search for something good to come out of the pandemic. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. We leave you tonight with a look up at the skies. The Lyrid meteor shower is peaking on this Earth Day. Stargazers around Canada are sharing their images of the dazzling show. Tonight's a new moon, and if you have clear skies where you are, you could spot up to 20 meteors an hour. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.